welcome to BevCam Studios. My name is Jamie Belsito, and I am very excited to have Richard to say in our studio today. He is the Republican candidate for the Massachusetts 6th Congressional District, of which Beverly is a part of. We're going to get a chance to get to know about Richard. Richard's been a uh, part of the fabric of Massachusetts politics uh, for quite a long time on a state level. And uh, I've had an opportunity to get to know Richard, and I, I think he uh, is, is definitely a wonderful guy to get to know, and we're going to take that opportunity to do that uh, today. And again, Richard, I just said you've been a staple of local politics for over two decades. How did you ever get into <laughs> politics, and how did all that time go by? Well, first, uh, thank you very much for having me on the show, and um, and I appreciate the opportunity. I have to meet 700,000 people really quick between now and the uh, election, so it's great to have this venue to just uh, get to, you know, have people get to know you. That's right. Um, just so people know, I wasn't born into a political family <laughs> or anything like that. My parents weren't even registered to vote. Um, the way I got involved in politics was sort of by a, f sort of flukish in a way. Um, <clears throat> there's a program called Student Government Day, and all the um, high schools across the Commonwealth participate in it. And every year, they have an election in each one of the you know uh, high schools, and somebody's elected to be the state representative for a day. And when I was at Linfield High School back in 1981, um, I was chosen by my classmates to be the state representative for a day. So they have a whole program set up that you go into the state house a number of times, and you propose bills, and then mm -hmm. the crescendo is the day that you actually get to go into the house chamber and sit down and um, vote, you know, debate and vote on all the bills. And and I think you know after that experience, I went home that night and my parents said to me, oh, how did it go? And I said, you know what, I'm going to be a state representative um, when I graduate from you know, school. And sure enough, um, that became my dream. And um, I was elected in 1984. I had just turned 22 years old. And my claim to fame is I'm the youngest uh, yes. Republican ever elected in Massachusetts. And um, that program is still in existence uh, today. And one out of three of every elected official in Massachusetts has gone through the program. So it was very inspiring. And uh, as far as teaching you about civics and the fact that one person can make a difference. So I, I'm, that's how I got involved. That's, so. an, that's an incredible story. I, you just had that connection when you got on the floor. Uh, and uh, I myself uh, am, am from Reading, and I know that you, uh, as you had pointed out, were the, the youngest, I think, overall elected uh, yeah. official. I don't know who else has challenged that uh, at this time, but to know that that opportunity exists in the high yeah. school setting yeah. is pretty uh, formidable. I I know a couple of issues that you've been champions on, uh, champion of rather uh, disabilities, mental yeah. health. Uh, for the was it 26 years you were at the state house, yep. you must have had some really near and dear issues that you yep. worked on. Yeah, every legislator. I was there 26 years, six years in the house and 20 in the senate, and every legislator pretty much carves out an area of policy that they want to be experts in and really you know be the person who can make some changes happen. And for me, uh, early on, I discovered you know that it was really human services. My mm -hmm. oldest sister is disabled. She lives in a group home right now. And my family, you know, over the years, that's something I've seen close up and have a really good understanding of. And I think that the government's job is to help take care of people who can't take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And the government, you know, is all of us, and we should be there to help people. And so I asked to be on the Human Service and Elderly Affairs Committee. And for most of my 20 years in the Senate, um, I served as a member of that committee, and so my issue set that I paid a lot of attention to uh, was mental illness, uh, mental um, uh, uh, retardation. Now it's you know developmental disabilities, uh, f physical um, disability, um, children's issues, particularly Department of Social Services. Um, we spent a lot of time on that. Um, and senior citizens issues. And um, I'd like to think I became an expert in all of them and certainly was involved in a lot of the different bills that came through the legislature. And I think, you know, that that's, government can really make a difference for people and those are the people that you want to make sure that there's a safety net set up for uh, to be able to help. And um, I've, I got a lot of different bills through and I fought 
for a lot of different appropriations and and it's still nice every now and again because it's just, you know if you have a child who's mentally you know um, uh, you know has ment mental retardation and mental illness uh, it's a very closed circle of people are that really pay attention and every now and again I'll be in the grocery store and somebody will come up to me and say you know what I really appreciated you fighting for my kid mm -hmm. you know to get them into services or I really appreciate what you did at the state house and it just makes you realize that um, the things that you do as an elected official can have just a tremendous impact on people at the ground level and that's why I really like public service you bring up uh, something, I, it's not the, it's along the same vein of Massachusetts politics. Right now, they just had that gubernatorial forum focused on mental health. Mm -hmm. You have a background of working on policy, state level, for mental health. And now we're taking a look that mental health is becoming an issue on the federal level as well. Yep. May was Mental Health Month. Um, I, I would say some of the stuff that you worked on on a state level would be very viable seeing you down in D.C. to work on yeah, those issues. It's a really good foundation to have and um, because especially understanding the way the state programs work because you know, ultimately what happens is all government, government is best when it's local and um, and you know, the federal, the further you go up the chain, local, state, federal, the further you get away from, you know, um, really understanding what's going on on the ground level. So having a good background and understanding the programs here, I think I can be a good voice in Washington to be able to say, hey, you know, we need help, um, with, you know, more money or less, you know, a different way of doing things for, for these particular programs. And one of the things I would say is um, a lot of people who are friends of mine in the human service community are really concerned right now um, because you know the federal government is obviously overextended mm -hmm. and they're concerned about the future of different programs and right now in the congressional delegation in Washington there is nobody from Massachusetts who's in the majority um, who can you know when decisions are being made and they're not always made on the house floor they're made in the yeah. cloakroom or the you know outside of the uh, chamber uh, there's really nobody from Massachusetts who's in the majority who's in the room when decisions are being made. And one of the things I think I can do as part of the majority party in Washington is to bring specific concerns for our state and our region and the programs that I really care about you know, into the discussion to try to make sure that they're dealt with um, fairly and you know, appropriately and in a way that really benefits people. That, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to loop back to that issue because I know for me hearing you say that it, it completely resonates you have uh, you have an entire state who in every single representative currently is democratic i want to go back to uh, you you speaking about policy or health i know i've heard you speak about the aca or obamacare no you were part of the legislature statewide yep. that rolled out <laughs> universal health care per yep. se right and you support that functionality um but I'd like to hear what the difference is state versus what was rolled out federally from your viewpoint. Well, um, it goes back to what I was just saying. You know, state is always better than federal mm -hmm. to, to, as far as doing something. And on the state level, we decided, both Democrats and Republicans, that it was unacceptable to have uninsured people in our state. And we all got together and we wrote a bill. Um, it was bipartisan. Mm -hmm. It was 77 pages long. Everybody knew what was in it. There weren't any surprises or you know curveballs that you know years later you found out this was inserted or that. And we passed it. And we had about 90 percent of the people in the state insured when we passed the bill. Mm -hmm. We were better off than any other state, anyways. But then when we finished, now we're up to 98, almost 99 percent of the citizens who have access to insurance. So on a state level, we did our job. We put together a bill. It wasn't perfect. I mean, there are parts of it I didn't agree with, but you know, you, for the whole, mm -hmm. it was worth doing. Mm -hmm. And I think most people in Massachusetts um, are supportive of what we did, as evidenced by the polling that shows the state law is very popular in Massachusetts. The federal government, by contrast, Fi um, passed a bill that was totally uh, a partisan bill. Not one member of the Republican Party supported it. It was very controversial at the time. It was 2,500 pages, and most people admit that they, you know, Nancy Pelosi said you have to pass the bill to understand what's in it. Mm -hmm. And now we're sort of paying for that because people are finding out different provisions of the bill, and um, you know, the the country is still divided on it. And I think like the better approach right now, just from my the way that I've, I see the world, 
would be to like let states do what Massachusetts did. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we put our plan together, we went to the federal government and said, this is sort of an experiment. Can you help us with it? And they gave us special consideration and a lot of money you know, to, to try to do it. And we did it based on what worked in Massachusetts. But on the federal level, once Obamacare passed, they came into all the states and pretty much said, this is one size, here's our bill, adjust to it. You mm -hmm, know, this mm -hmm. is the way it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. No um, waivers, no, you know. And here in Massachusetts, it really set us back because here we are a state that did our job, 98% of the people are insured, and people have been negatively impacted here. And the governor, most people don't realize, went to the president on three different occasions and said, can you give us a waiver? You know, there are certain parts of the bill that are interfering with what we're doing here. And the president said no. And you know, it's funny because Nancy Pelosi got a waiver for all the nightclubs and bars in her district and there were like a thousand waivers given out, you know, that people, you know, um, 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 politically connected people sure. got. But here we are, a state of six million people, and we couldn't hear and get a little consideration that did, you know, a state that did its job. So I think I'd like to see it fixed. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're never going to repeal um, the Affordable Care Act, but you can fix it in a way to make it easier for states to be able to implement. And then there are other provisions, and I don't want to keep on going on this, but the like the medical device tax. Here in the North Shore, we have one of the highest concentrations of medical device companies anywhere in the country. I think we're number three, um, and that's a growth industry, they're creating all kinds of jobs. Well, in this Obamacare, there was a 2.3% excise tax on gross revenue. So that means that if you're a small startup company, um, the tax isn't on your profit, it's on your gross income. So you could be a startup losing $200,000 a year, but you're gonna have to pay the, the, the extra right. tax. And what's happened is, is a lot of those companies that are, were growing and creating jobs here in you know, Beverly and other places, uh, have put hiring freezes on and they're laying people off and they don't have the money for research and development. So um, I would repeal that law. And Elizabeth Warren, it's not a partisan thing, she came out and said this is a terrible law for Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. It's going to stifle job creation and innovation. And you know, so those are some of the things I think you can fix individual parts of the law and just you know, do the best we can with it right now. So again, you, you, we agree with the model. You helped roll that model out. It was more or less a pilot program, I think, in many yeah. senses, Massachusetts. For here, in Massachusetts. Yes. But it doesn't mean it's going to work in Utah. That's right. You know, they might want to do something else, and the federal government should support them. And then if you have all the states doing different things, and the federal government's just saying, hey, let's get everybody insured. Here are the benchmarks you have until this year to get, you know, your rate up to 95, 90 mm -hmm. cent, whatever. Um, that's the way it should work. You know, the federal government should encourage states, and, and then if one state's doing something great, everybody else should copy them, <laughs> if it works for them, you and know? It, and it worked to you. Um, yeah, so, you know. So what I'm hearing from you, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric. I, myself, am an uh, independent voter. You always hear Republicans uh, aren't for coverage, Democrats are. That's not what we're talking about here. No, you know what? They're, well, in our country right now, it's really sad because you have extremes on one side or the other. So there are some people that want to take over the whole health insurance and uh, a whole health field mm -hmm. and just make it so that the government totally controls decisions and patients don't really have that. Sort of like the VA, you know, and there'll be lines and, you know, all that. Then there are other people who just want to repeal what we have and not have anything and everybody's off on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you just, there aren't enough reasonable people in the middle who can just say, you know what, it's a good thing for Americans to be covered with health insurance and it should be one of the goals of the government to make sure that everybody does have insurance affordable uh, that's available to them. And I want to be one of those people that's level-headed, you know, that can say, hey, let's do what we need to do to, to, to help people. I, I, I like the messages that you're you're giving because we're talking about uh, just common sense. We're not talking about uh, something that that I often consider when I'm you know, watching John Stewart at night, <laughs> or talking to my husband or or other friends of mine, uh, you know, who even graduate graduated from Salem State. You know, you go to working class uh, college, a university over here, and we all put ourselves through school. And and uh, but now we're we're parents and homeowners and all these things. So where do you kind of uh, draw the line you, you you've you've talked about before you know party politics and you see this this kind of momentum of party before 
people it, and yeah. you're not talking that talk. Well, it kind of drives me crazy again because you have so much division in the country and you know, my district, and you lived in it at one point, um, was only 10% Republican when I was a state senator. Yes. But yet I would win because yes. people, even if they didn't agree with me on everything, they would know that I would always try to analyze things and do what I thought was best for the people in the state. And I think like the biggest problem in the country right now that it's like really dangerous is the fact that you have so many um, Democrats who vote 99% of the time with the leader. You have so many Republicans who vote 99% of the time with the leader. And they love their party more than they love the country. Mm -hmm. And the reason the country is in so much trouble is because they don't put the country first. And you know, people will make a lot of different promises. The only promise I'll make during the campaign is that I'll do the same thing I did when I was in the state senate. And I'll, I'll look at every bill and say what's best for the people of this region and what's best for the country as a whole. And the one thing I would say to people is that a lot of people will come in and say, oh, I'll well, be independent, and then they go and they're not. Um, I took 10,000 votes, mm -hmm. and I'm not exaggerating, mm -hmm. over the course of 26 years. And I would get in a lot of trouble all the time because I would always, you know, when Governor Romney was the governor, I voted with him 50% of the time. I voted against him 50% of the time. And I didn't do it on purpose. I just looked at every single thing and said, what's best for the state and the people I represent? And that's what I'll do, the same type of thing as the congressman for this district. And my criticism of the current congressman really is that he's one of those people who votes 99% of the time. And no party is right you know, 100% of the time. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I also own a real estate company and a good real estate person, um, if you're successful, is, you know, you, you, you have emotional buyers, emotional mm -hmm. sellers, mm -hmm. obstacles in the middle, and a good realtor will remove the obstacles and to bring the parties together to consummate a sale. And you can't do that if you're an ideologue, you know, and we need people in Washington who are willing to remove the obstacles and find common ground to get things done. And that's what I'm all about. You know, I'll get, th there are Republicans who don't like me for certain reasons, there are Democrats, you know, but at the end of the day, as long as I can defend what I'm doing, that it's helping people, um, I think people respect that and, and they'll be supportive of it. Uh, my takeaway in having listened to you here and listened to you previously, uh, I'm going to make a comparison here that I think is a great one, is that of a, of a Tip O'Neill. You know, all politics are, are local. And, you know, maybe he was a party man, and there is definite uh, reasons why people are with the party, but well, you're talking at, about people. Uh, look at Tip O'Neill for a minute, though. Very, very strong in his beliefs. So, so was Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And the two of them would fight and, you know, you know, and, and it was all great theater. But at the end of the day, they would go and they would sit and have a beer together. That's right. And they had personal interaction and they got to know each other and they did what was right ultimately for the country. And, um, and I think that's what we need to go back to. And the good thing I would say is that in the congressional delegation right now, you know, Bill Keating is the congressman from the Cape. I sat next to him in the state senate for a long time. Steve Lynch is probably the one in the delegation I respect the most because he's willing to speak his mind. He isn't always, you know, straight party. I served with him in the state senate. Mike Capuano, um, he was a staff person when I was a state representative. Ed Markey's known me since I was in high school. I know all of them, and I think what I could do is be able to go in and say, you know what, I can add something to this delegation. Being in the majority, I can get things, you know, done easier. Uh, you can't get a lot done down there if you're in the minority. And be able to work for them and say, you know what, what do we need here in Massachusetts? What do we need in New England? Let's, let me help you. And I think I can add something and, um, and make the delegation stronger. That bipartisanship, I know in, in my particular demographic, we salvate over <laughs> that want and need right. for bipartisanship, uh, you know, even even as a mo as a mother, you're trying to teach your children. You've got to learn how to work with other people. And I'm really boiling it down into Sesame Street language with this because there is an aspect of yeah. that of being able to play in the sandbox together. Yeah. And it's very interesting to hear you say you already have those relationships yeah. and you can play in the sandbox, and they'll play in the sandbox with you as well. And then you take it. And I want to hear a little bit more about okay, a big meeting is called, you're GOP, you're able to go to the meeting. You're also coming at this 
uh, you know, in a Massachusetts way. You are an mm -hmm. openly gay married candidate who is totally bipartisan, who is coming from one of the more left-leaning states in the nation, right? So here mm -hmm. you are at the table, and I'd like to just maybe hear a little bit about, about <laughs> that, what your thoughts are. And well, it's not being afraid to say no, you know. Um, I mean, I looked Romney, Governor Romney, and I was in his office, looked him right in the eye. You know, he had asked me to <clears throat> vote away I didn't want to, and I just said no, and here's why. And, you know, ultimately, um, people respect you when you do that, I think. It's not necessarily a problem if you can explain why, you know, what your principles are and what you're trying uh, to accomplish. And, um, and if you're not, you know, if you're not afraid to do that, you'll, you'll end up in such good shape. And there are, so, there are enough Democrats, I think, there aren't, there aren't a lot in the Congress, but there are enough Democrats and enough Republicans who really are like, they've had it with what's going on, and they'll try to do the right thing. And you don't need a lot of them, you need 30 or 40 of them to sort of band together so when certain issues come, you know, you can kind of push things through. Um, you know, but on the other hand, I will say, um, fuel assistance program, mm -hmm. nobody from the South really cares about yeah. that, nobody from the West. So when that comes up, um, there's nobody again in the room from Massachusetts. I'll be. I want to have a good relationship with the speaker mm -hmm. and the leadership mm -hmm. to be able to call up and say, "Hey, I got a big problem up in my region. You know, um, you, there isn't enough money in the fuel assistance program. I mean, the president, you know, and President Obama doesn't um, propose enough money. Right. You know, and here it's life and death. Yes. So that's like an issue of fishing in Gloucester. Um, you know, if John Tierney's out there demonizing the speaker and the leadership, um, when it comes to getting fishing relief for fishermen who the government has totally put out of business, do you think, you know, they're going to take his phone call or, or give him the time of day? You know, and it goes the other way, too. I mean, I always learn that you don't burn your bridges. When I was the minority leader in the Senate, you and I could have a big brawl one day about an issue. But the next day, I learned, you know, I need you. We might be the biggest closest allies, propose, you know, proponents of another issue. So why do you, why would anybody, I wouldn't do it with Nancy Pelosi or any of them, why would you want to alienate people in a legislative body, you know, to um, not to be, you know, you make yourself ineffective. And, you know, um, I got a lot of stuff done. At the, I mean, the thing I'm most proud of and uh, being at the state house is I had a gentleman come in to see me who worked at a hospital in my district. He saw things that were going on that were substandard care. Mm -hmm. And he said, what should I do? And I said, you know, he said, I've gone to the hospital and the, they won't do anything. I said, well, you should report it to the state. And sure enough, he went and reported it to the state. The state came in and said, you know what, he's right. And the hospital had to take corrective action. But then the hospital fired him for doing that. And it opened my eyes that there was a big problem because most healthcare employees are at will employees. They had no protection at all. So I wrote a whistleblower protection bill that pretty much said anybody in Massachusetts who is, works in a nursing home, a hospital, any healthcare facility, if they see anything and report it to the state, they can't be, held, they can't be fired or held back for a promotion or retaliated against at work. Um, and I worked with the Mass Nurses Association. I found Democrats to support me. And, and I got the bill passed. And you know, here I am, a Republican, outnumbered you know, 10 to 1 at the State House. But I had a good idea, and I was willing to work with people. And we got things done. And that's what you need. You know, if you have goodwill and you're really trying to do something, the, the power of ideas a lot of times you know, will propel themselves. They just need you know, people to you know, help, you know, help clear the way to, right. to do it. So that's the type of stuff that I, I worked on when I, was, when I was in Boston. I love hearing these stories because, again, we need to understand. You know, I understand because of the district I was in. We're looking at, as you said, a 770,000 plus district that right. you're that you're courting per right. se, and you have an incredible record of bipartisanship. You also have something I thought was interesting. What? In my my friend Holly Harrington Stern put it very well the other evening in speaking about why would Richard choose to be a Republican in a Democratic state, and you have your own <laughs> reasons why. Well, I have my own. I probably am anti-establishment, whatever, uh, to some extent. Um, but I think that um, the government is better when it's smaller. I think um, I'm a small business owner, so I believe in the free enterprise system. I think the Republican Party offers a better platform for small business owners as far as taxes, regulations, job creation. I believe in a strong national defense, and um, and I you know I, I can think for myself. Mm -hmm. I don't you know um, the Republican Party traditionally was the party of civil rights and the party that always tried to expand 
these, you know, whether it, we were formed on the basis of abolishing slavery, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we were the ones who led the women's suffrage movement and made Native Americans full-fledged citizens. And it's, the party sort of veered off. But I believe in the original intent of what being a Republican means, and that is that everybody's treated equally and fairly under the law, that we're a nation of laws and not men, and that, you know, so everybody, you know, our, our Constitution means something as far as um, the way people are treated in, uh, in the country. And I feel totally comfortable. And, you know, um, I don't always agree with the National Party mm -hmm. um, on a lot of different mm -hmm. issues, particularly on gay marriage, mm -hmm. on, um, uh, on women's health issues. But um, if you want to change things, you know, um, you need, you know, not only, you need to change, I think not only can I be a great congressman for this district, but I can also go to Washington and change the party somewhat and say, hey, we don't need to reinvent ourselves. We need to look back at what we've always been and sort of go back to that model. And, you know, um, ha Northeast Republicans, and especially in this district, amazing. I mean, the lodges, the salt and stalls, the people who played um, just tremendous roles in the history of this country that were all a certain type of philosophical, you know, Republican. I think I can, you know, help uh, put that on the map again. I love hearing that. I think what you're talking about is is what need that banter need to be discussed. We're looking yeah. at. Uh, you know, f fanaticism to I think an extent within yeah. the, these parties, within both parties. <laughs> I, I always think? say party, <laughs> just a little bit. I think in some ways party politics yeah. are dead, but it's the only system that we have. And I, and I, I feel it's it's fresh, it's exciting what you're talking about. I'm reinvigor reinvigorated to be participatory in this particular election because of what you're speaking about and because well, of who you are. And here's what I would say: like um, there are 435 congressmen, um, but they're all the districts are sort of drawn up in a way so nobody who ever loses and, and it's unfortunate. So there are only 40 seats in the entire country that are considered in play that could change this election cycle and then there's only about 15 that nobody knows what the outcome is going to be. This is one of the 15 and two years ago when I ran I was like oh god this is going to be so hard but people came out of the woodwork. I was just from all different walks of life I was Really, I mean, it's such a humbling um, feeling. And 53% of the people in this district said we want change and voted for somebody other than the incumbent, which is like incredible. Um, and it turned out it was a three-way race mm. and, and, and so there wasn't a majority. You know, the, the change vote got, you know, uh, split in two. Right. But it tells me like that there's a, like a lot of hope. People are really hungry for something different and, and know that it's a time for a change. and. And I always say when I go to an event, I'll always say the same thing. You know, raise your hand if you have kids or grandkids, and everybody does. And then I'll say, raise your hand if you think your kids and grandkids are going to have a better standard of living, a better job opportunities, better education than you've had in your lifetime. And nobody ever raises their hands because people are like so concerned about what's happening to the country right now. Like we, you know, it's, it's, and this is the first time in American history that, you know, that one generation you know, is passed off to the next generation, a country in worse shape than they found it. So people understand something's wrong, you know, we have to change course, and the only way you're going to do it, we have such a great opportunity here to do it, to send a message saying enough's enough, and, you know, and to try to, um, try to change things. And um, so, you know, there's, there's hope. I, I <laughs> believe, I believe there. there is too. I, I really do. You see a city like Beverly that's changing, there's an incredible, uh, change going on as a whole within within what you're talking about within the city uh, where we're looking as far as our piece here today is coming to a close um, I really wanted to get into how your husband supported you through three elections two congressional <laughs> races and and you know how, how's the dog gonna feel about getting down to DC and all those good yeah. things uh, but I really think the essence of who you are has come through today and as an independent voice and as a as someone who loves Beverly I, I really truly hope that people open their ears to different I ideas yep. uh, in, in, in vote based on behalf of what's going to be best for the district. Um, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to bring this side of who you are uh, as a person uh, to, to BevCam and I want to say thank you. Thank you. I have the, uh, I'm thrilled to be here and I, um, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be able to represent the people in this area.
That's wonderful. Again, uh, thank you again, Richard Desai, a Republican candidate on the congressional ballot for Massachusetts 6th District. Jamie Belsito uh, signing off from BevCam, and I want to thank everyone for taking a moment to keep their minds open and uh, keep engaged for this upcoming election in November.